3, and uh, this is the theme text. Last week we started uh, doing a teaching, and tonight's going to be part 2, and I'm pretty confident there's going to be at least uh, a part 3 next week. I, I think we'll, unless I get uh, super inspired, but I think there's a few more things I want to cover on this one. I just want to touch base and remind us the theme of this little mini-series we're doing is the first few verses of, of Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Everybody say dispensation. Okay, which is given to me to you word. Now again, that word dispensation translated in Greek, an English word that's a, a good word would probably be administration. Uh, so this is God, Paul is saying there is a, a management and an administration of the grace of God that's been given to him for the, uh, for the church. How? That by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, uh, which in other ages, that's the other thing we're talking about, other ages, everybody say other ages, um, was not made known unto the sons of men, but it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now there's a lot of verses we could have used for a, a theme text on this, uh, but I think this one kind of sums it up in so much as it, it, it talks about he's, he's acknowledging there are ages and stages and dispensations that we can talk about. And that's the title of this mini-series tonight is part two. Let's ask God to, uh, to help us tonight. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for the people that have gathered into the sanctuary this evening. And I'm asking you to bless not only this Bible study, but I'm asking you to bless the ministry going on in our youth and in our children's department and our young marriage tonight, I ask you to bless all of that in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Mm -hmm. Wave it four or five people. Bless them in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You may be seated. So I'm, I want to just take a few minutes to kind of recap where we where we ended last week just to remind you uh, and I hope if any of you missed last Wednesday night I hope you got a chance to watch it on archive because uh, the this stuff kind of sews together into a theme and a thought and if you miss any of it you'll there'll be some parts missing to your knowledge of it but I talked last week about having four points of personal hermeneutics and I started just sharing a little bit about my viewpoint of, of that I come from when studying the Word of God and was trying to teach uh, a, a similar one to the church. And then we talked about the fact that the early church, and this is where we were swerving into before we ended last week, uh, that the early church believed that Jesus was coming in their day. And they believed it very strongly, uh, even to the point uh, and, and by the way, we should believe it as well. And you say, well, you, you know, he hasn't come all this time, so why are we getting anxious about it now? Be careful of that spirit. Because <laughs> Paul warned that would be one of the problematic spirits of, of end times. Since the fathers fell asleep, all things remain the same as they are. As I was teaching last week, anything that, that puts it in your spirit to, to delay or postpone or put off the idea of the coming of the Lord, you need to be suspicious of it. Amen. That, that's, that's what, because the fruit of that is, not, is usually not good. And so I think God designed it that way. I believe that the Lord designed it so that every generation would live in expectancy. Even though in reality there's only going to be one generation that's going to be alive when he comes out of all of them. So but still there, we know we don't know who it is. So but he said comfort one another with these words. Turn with me to the Acts 17th chapter. And uh 
I, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, and, and pick up where we left off. And again, I want to remind you, we, the coming of the Lord should excite you and comfort you, not terrorize you. <laughs> if you're terrorized at the idea of the Lord coming, then that, that's a good sign that you need some altar time. <laughs> And, uh, and, and you need to get some, some things put together. Um, the second coming of the Lord and the catching away of the church, uh, regardless of what your idea or thinking is about when and how it happens, if it's connected or disconnected or whatever, but the simple reality of it is it is a very motivating factor toward holy living. And holy living requires some, some spiritual motivation because there's very little things in the flesh that will excite you about it. It is a spiritual decision uh, to please God. Now, Paul, in Acts 17, uh, look at verse 1 there. He, this is where he established the church at Thessalonica. Now, we, we ended with this uh, passage. Uh, he came to uh, Thessalonica uh, he started ministering to the Jews in the synagogue in verse 2 as his manner was. Uh, he spent uh, three Sabbath days there reasoning with them out of the scriptures. Notice that he, he was not just arguing a, his point of view. He was arguing the scriptures. He was contending with the scriptures. That ought to be our deal too, is that every position that we take, we should have a, a root in it somewhere back into the Word of God as to why we believe this. Uh, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, uh, etc. And then he, he, he said, I preach unto you uh, is, is, the, is the Christ. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of them, verse 4, believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and devout Greeks in a great multitude of, uh, uh, and of chief women, not a few. Now again, so in, in, in three weeks' time, Paul nonstop for three weeks' time was, was interjecting, preaching the gospel, having an effect, and in that brief of a time, he was already producing converts, which is pretty amazing, especially among the Jews who were already considered themselves very religious people. And yet, because, and, and this, is a, this is a theory of mine, and that is this, you know, truth stands on its own. You, 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 as a matter of fact, truth and untruth, when you bring them together and let the two of them in the ring by themselves, truth always wins. If you, in the arena of ideas, if you let truth contend with, with false teaching, truth always makes more sense and wins out. The dilemma is that the enemy knows that, and so when he, uh, he does everything he can to keep truth from having a fair fight with error. And the example is verse 5. He couldn't stop the, the revival. He couldn't stop the fact that it was making sense to them and they were, they were becoming converts. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy and took unto them certain lewd fellows of a baser sort and gathered a, a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So here's the point. It, when it, you know, there's an old saying in in you know in debating and stuff. You know, when when somebody runs out of ammunition, they just start calling you names. <laughs> the devil does the same thing. When when there was nothing else they could do to stop it, he tried to create a, a, a riot to 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 get distraction off of truth. Get get uh, you know just so. In other words, he'll do two things. He will either fight to distract us from truth. Or he will endeavor to discredit the speaker in our mind. And you and I, by the way, little side note here, have better develop a love for the truth. And if you can only hear truth from, from certain individuals, you might have a problem going on in your spirit that's going to give you trouble down the road. I, I want to hear truth. And, and, and truth is is more important than personality. And so even if I don't like somebody that's telling me the truth, I should still value truth. So Paul started this church in Thessalonica about 51 AD. This is where we were 
what we were talking about at the end. He fled to, uh, to Berea. He went to Athens and to Corinth. There was great persecution uh, that, that rose up. He ended up in Thessalonica, and that's what we read about. Then later on from Corinth, he wrote two letters to the, back to the Thessalonican people or to the church, and he, he had four reasons. If you read the whole, and, and they're short, relatively short. Uh, there's only like five, five chapters in one and uh, three or four chapters in the other. I don't remember offhand, but it's very short. But, but uh, they had four reasons. Number one, he was aware of the great persecution, and he wanted to inspire them to, to persevere. Just hang on. Don't, don't let go. And also, because he ended up leaving earlier than he intended, he was trying to go back and answer questions that he knew they were still having and because these, there were going to be questions of their faith, and he had to try to strengthen them. He also wanted to correct misinformation and false accusations about uh, his departure. Again, the enemy is, again, let me give you a clue. The enemy is always trying to discredit any speaker of truth to get us to discredit in our mind because it's not that he cares about the speaker. He's, he's worried about you getting truth. And then the last one, which was the biggie, uh, and this is where we ended, was he wanted to clear up some confusion about the end of the age. There, was a, there were people literally teaching them already that the resurrection had already come. Jesus had already come back. You had missed the rapture, all that. There was just a convoluted teaching going on. And, and so there was confusion. And so he steps in and writes to them and starts uh, correcting this to try to correct the anxiety. Now, when I say Paul went after it, he went after it. And, and what's interesting is uh, he knew... He knew when you, that he had to present something to the people of God to give them the strength to be able to get up every morning and walk the course of faith despite the persecution, despite the, the hardships and so forth that were being put on. And so in First and Second Thessalonians, only eight chapters in total, Paul talked talk about the second coming of the Lord, uh, seven out of eight of those chapters. And so he did this. Now, I want to go through them real fast. If you have uh, your Bible, open up 1 Thessalonians. We're just going to, we're just going to hit it and, and move quickly on them. But I literally want to show you this. We didn't get time to do it last week. Um, I, I want to show you how important Paul thought, I believe, because he understood that, that getting the coming of the Lord into your spirit is a key factor toward victorious living. And believing that the Lord would come and set things right, it gives people fortitude. So in the first chapter of First Thessalonians, go down to verse 9. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how we turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and, everybody say and, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us uh, from the wrath to come. So it's the first time that he mentioned it in the first chapter. He's talking about we need to wait and be ready for when the Lord comes. Then turn the page to 1 Thessalonians 2 and look down at verse 19. He said, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and our joy. He was talking about to the church. He said, what, what's the hope? What, what's the greatest thing that we're looking forward to? He said, I'm looking forward to seeing the church on that day. Paul was sharing what was motivating him. Look at verse, turn the page to chapter 3 and look down at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. Uh, one toward another and toward all men, even as you do toward you, even as we do toward you. Excuse me. Look at verse thirteen. To the end, everybody say the end, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, with all of His saints. Notice he just keeps reminding them over and over. Now, now originally. When Paul wrote the letter, of course, it didn't have chapters and verses to it. It was just a letter that he just wrote it straight forward. But when we when we divided it up, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, into chapter and verse, it's just interesting to me that, that it, it kind of falls in every chapter he's talking about it. 
Turn the page to the fourth chapter. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. This is the famous one. For the Lord himself, everybody say the Lord, shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now by the time he got to the fourth chapter, he's getting real serious about it. He's starting to get, he's starting to get preachy. <laughs> And he starts laying it out, and and it start, and I, I and and what's interesting to me is is this in this in these two letters, he deals with this to the Thessalonican church. He deals with all of them, but he he really hammers it home to them. Turn the page to the fifth chapter, verse twenty three, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you who also will do it. Turn the page into the second Thessalonian letter, the first chapter, verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul understood that if he was going to motivate the church and light a fire within the hearts of God's people to live right and be holy and, and to serve the king and hang on even through discouragement, uh, there's only one powerful thing. Now, you can yell at people about, about going to hell and try to make them afraid if you want. That'll last for a little while, but it never lasts long term. Uh, the only thing that's going to last long term uh, is we got to get a love in our heart and an expectancy for the coming of the Lord uh, within us. Um, amen? Mm. Turn to page to uh, the second chapter. He opens it up in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, he was trying to tell them, calm down, we have not missed it. <laughs> Let no man deceive you by any means. And then, then he, he, he was explaining something to give them a little bit of a timetable. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first uh, and that man of sin be revealed, which he was referring to the son of perdition. Now that falling away, Paul was literally saying there's going to become a great apostasy where there's going to be a lot of people that profess to be Christian, profess Christ, etc., that are going to turn away. And, and there will also be in, in that time, season, a... Uh, a revealing of the son of perdition. Now, here's the point. They still were expecting it in their day. He, I, I believe Paul was still ex expecting it. They, they, the early church lived with, the, with the, the thrill of the fact that he's coming before I die. And it didn't go away even though Paul started laying out these things because they didn't know when it was going to be. Uh, and then look down in verse uh, chapter 2, excuse me, go, go down to verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So I, I wanted to take the time and, and read all of those because I wanted us to, to understand the ongoing flow of, of what the Apostle Paul was doing over and over again, just hammering. He's coming back. He's coming back. The church is going to be caught away. Uh, we're going to meet him in the air. Comfort yourself with this. He had to help refocus their minds. Uh, and we're living, I think, in a day, even though I, I, I would be cautious uh, to call it uh, persecution. We're, we're, the church is suffering some persecution in our day, but not the same kind that they were suffering back then. Now, I got a bad feeling some of that's on its way. <laughs> 
but uh, for now, there is, you know, some annoyances and some things that we're having. But I'll tell you what, what our bigger problem is, is just the utter distraction by the craziness of this world and end time deceptions and so many things going on. After a while, it can just wear you out and just you just get tired of thinking about it. And, and the enemy wants to wear out the saints. But I want to tell you, anytime you need, when you get to feeling kind of, you know, low, low energy, low, just feeling rough, you need, you need to look for some high vitamin drink to get in you. Start reading about the coming of the Lord. Start thinking about the coming of the Lord. Start singing about the coming of the Lord. Amen. Uh, and I told you last week, you know, Brother Urshan's father told him, uh, whenever you're worried about the church, just start preaching about the coming of the Lord because the true saints of God will start to respond and their hearts will start to get in tune with, with the coming of the Lord because the Holy Ghost designed it that way. And, and what I'm trying to get across to us is that every generation should expect it. Now, you know, when we look back on it now from a historical standpoint, I think it is arguable that we, that we could say now maybe something today that we, we couldn't have said before. Uh, it, could it be argued that until the fig tree budded that we really couldn't, you know, we really weren't expecting the coming of the Lord? And, and that would probably be true. But I don't think they knew when the fig tree was going to bud. <laughs> and, and I think even us, who we're getting closer and closer to the end of this thing to the church age, and, and we're, we're seeing stuff start to rise up and happen, and, and you know, we're, we're kind of like I want to shoot rubber bands at it, and, and you know, is this that? Is that it? Is this that? And, and we're going to miss it sometimes. We're going to think, we're going to think, all right, there, there. Uh, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> but I, let me tell you something. I would rather be excitingly watching for the coming of the Lord but just be careful you don't get to barking up trees without any, you know, without seeing anything up there. <laughs> but I'd rather miscall something in my spirit than to just be ignoring end time stuff when we're living in the middle of it. You understand what I'm saying to the church? All right. Let's worship him for a minute. Just let's take a 10 second praise break here. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the name of the Lord. Lord, would you put it in our spirit? Help us to get ready. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, get our eyes off of all this crazy that's going on all around us and get our eyes uh, focused back on you and the fact that he's coming again. Because the coming of the Lord is a creator, uh, or uh, let me rephrase it, is a motivator of faithfulness. If you're going to be faithful to something, you're going to have to have to make some decisions and you're going to have to to make some because emotions come and go. There's going to be days you feel good about and there's going to be days you don't feel good about. But but there's got to be something that may, helps us be faithful no matter whether it's a good day or a bad day. So that's why I was talking about last week, when you're surveying all the various thoughts and ideas and concepts uh, uh, about uh, whenever a doctrine or an idea is presented to you and, and you start to, uh, you know, do it. One of the things that I think is a good basic hermeneutic to use uh, is, is get into your mind and think uh, and, and, and try to connect the dots and determine if I buy into this, where does it lead? You know, most shoppers that are concerned about their health will take time in the grocery aisle to read the, the, the stuff on the back of the label. <laughs> and how many of you have ever had an experience when you think, hey, that looks good, and you think, oh, no, that don't look good. <laughs> or if you're on certain medications that you can't have certain things and something looks really good, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, I can't do that, you know, because of. And that's what I mean by connecting dots, looking forward. You, you can't just swallow up an idea and a thought just because it sounds cool <laughs> or it sounds new. Let me tell you something. We are way too long into the history of this thing to come up with something new. <laughs> just understand, if you've got an idea that you think is new, <laughs> it ain't new. <laughs> it's been, you, everything's retread. <laughs> 
from generation to generation. Solomon said there is no new thing under the sun, and that was thousands of years ago. And he was right then, and it's still right today. So the Holy Ghost was given us to help lead us into all truth. And one of the ways that, that the Holy Ghost leads us is he gives us, I believe the Lord gave us three main sources to help triangulate. And we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, but we, we talked about the, the Word of God uh, the, itself, the book that we're holding in our hand, the preaching of the voice of God that God's put it into our life, also the Holy Ghost that's within us. And those three things, when, you, when they're, they're agreement and, and, and they're, you, it's how, it's how uh, they find it where a ship is at sea. It's got to get points to triangulate from. And you can find out where you are. I want to share with you uh, the, so a couple of those things. When we talk about ages and stages and dispensations, what do, I, what do I mean by that? All right, here's the thing. The Bible says that we are to rightly divide the word, right? Mm -hmm. We read that last week. Now, we, we talked about the fact when he said rightly divide the word, it literally in the Greek meant to, uh, it, it literally was translated straight cutting or dissecting. So when he is saying that you have to rightly divide the word, he literally is saying you have to correctly cut it straight. Don't make crooked, crooked cuts. You ever see these gerrymandered congressional district things? If you ever seen one of the maps, it looks like they're, it was, they were either created by evil people or drunk people. <laughs> or both. <laughs> and you think, you know... You even look at the states. How, how does some of that crazy stuff come? Just, you know, when we're, when we're dividing the word, you can't go, you can't grab one verse here, one verse there, and a passage over here and put it together and come up with a doctrine. Because if you do that, you can come up, you could, the Bible can give you, you can come up with anything. I can do all things to a, a text, a verse taken out of context. I love that meme. And the Bible says Judas... Uh, hung himself. It also, Jesus said, "Whatever you do, do us likewise." You know, uh, you can pull scripture out and try to teach somebody. You need to go out as fast as you can and hang yourself, <laughs> and and you got Bible for it. But what you don't have is rightly divided word. So that's what that's what he's talking about when he says rightly divide, straight cut it, right cut it. How do you eat an elephant? The old saying. One bite at a time. So what's the first thing you do when you're in a situation like that? When you've got something so mammoth that there's no way you could absorb it, you got to start cutting it into manageable pieces that, if nothing else, is there to help me engraft it, help me understand it. So one of the things from a theological standpoint we need to know is that when the Bible talks about the ages, in the ages to come, all right, first thing we're talking about, ages and stages. Uh, theoretically, or not theoretically, theologically, I should say, there are, uh, there are uh, four major, huge, large ages in biblical theology. Uh, Dr. Nate Wilson wrote about these categories, and, and, and again, it's, it's common theology among scholars and so forth. But number one is what is known as the creative age. And then there is the uh, antediluvian age. And then there's the present age, or some call it the church age. And then there's the ages of ages. Now, this isn't hard to follow, but so let me just give you this on the four, the four big Bible ages, if I could call it that way. The creative age is talking about prior to the creation of earth. Okay. Now, we know God's eternal. We're not. The earth is not eternal. But we do not know how old it is. And, and every one of these professors that get up and like to pontificate about it's this, that, and I just laugh at them because they do not know. And to act like you know, to me, is arrogant. <laughs> and so it's, they're guessing at it. And when you have to guess something into the millions, 
you're you know you're you're so far off of being accurate it don't even matter anymore <laughs> just admit we don't know i don't know why that's so hard <laughs> but the it was prior to creation now again we don't know very much about this time period we know god's eternal we know the earth isn't so we know there was a time before the heavens and the earth but we don't know much about it the Bible doesn't tell us much about it. Then you come to the antediluvian age, and that literally means the time before the floods. A fancy word that, I don't know who came up with that one. Time before floods seems easier to me. <laughs> but this is basically talking about the time from the creation of Adam to the flood of Noah. Again, these are large ages. Of course, the second age is the antediluvian age is nowhere near as long as the creational age. And we don't even, we don't know how long that is. We do have some understanding of the antediluvian age. Then we come to the present age, which is talking about, uh, it, it literally means from, from uh, the flood of Noah, it picks up there. Uh, when earth was redone, and then it follows all the way through on, on the new creation of man, so to speak, all the way through to the second coming of the Lord. Okay? And that's uh, it, it, so it really, I guess it would be better to call it the present age. Uh, again, you call it the church age. We, we usually say the church age, we mean from 33 A.D. on. But from, a, from an age, a big picture, view uh it goes back really to the flood of noah because just like from adam to the end of noah there was a whole story of mankind that disappeared and then it started afresh with noah and his family now this is the story of humanity all the way to the second coming of the lord which brings us to the last big stage in theology and that's called the age of ages and that's basically talking about after the second coming and everything moving forward from that. The millennial reign and everything that happens after that. And we do not know how long that is either. We don't know. But the point is, is that you just divide it. You start by dividing ages and stages and dispensations to start getting a mental handle on how to understand the word of the Lord. Bring up Isaiah 45. And verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. Everybody say vain. Mm. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So God speaks to the prophet Isaiah and, and Isaiah records the word of the Lord. And this is super interesting to me because I want you to notice that the Lord, uh, Isaiah recorded that when God created the earth, he created it to be inhabited and, and to be established that, that way. But he, and in the Bible specifically, he did not make it in vain. All right, now, what's vain mean? That word vain uh, did not mean vanity the way that we think of the word vanity. In the Hebrew, it was the word tohu. I think is how you pronounce it. <laughs> but T-O-H-U-W would be the closest English thing. But here's what it means. It means to lie in waste or desolation. So Isaiah is prophesying that the Lord spoke to him and said, When I made the earth... I made it to be inhabited, in other words, to be lived in and lived on. And when I made it, I did not make it lying in waste and desolation. As a matter of fact, you'll recall from the book of Genesis that when the Lord recorded the whole process for historical sake, uh, he noted at the end of every day, he pronounced it, uh, and God said it was what? Good. Okay. So what God was saying is, I made it right. I didn't make it into a mess. I didn't start it as a mess. Now the reason that's interesting is when you go back to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that, that verse is establishing the reality of God's creation that goes way back somehow, some way back into prehistoric times, uh, back into the creative age, 
I don't believe we know when that was. I don't believe we know uh, how long ago that was. I do not believe in my own thinking that the creation of man is exactly cre uh, connected with the creation of the earth and the heavens. I think the earth and the heavens have, were in flow long before uh, us, but I think the Bible tells the story about our turn in the rotation. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you think of that book and how complicated it is now just talking about us, can you imagine what it would have been like if God started opening up a book telling us about all the things that happened in prehistoric times with other creations and other beings and other, you know, that bunch that John saw, you know, beasts and elders around the throne of Revelation, where'd they come from? And, and if, we, if we were going to begin to get on into all that, there, there ain't enough time in our lifetime to know all of that. But we will understand it better by and by because we're going to get to interview some of them. <laughs> so we know that. So verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now that word form in the Hebrew is the exact same toho Hebrew word that was used in Isaiah 45 when the Lord said, I did not create the world in, in vain. I didn't form it in chaos. But that's exactly what this means. It means to lie in waste. So what we have is Genesis 1.1, we have two witnesses of the word that says God created this correctly and rightly in the beginning and created it to be lived in. So he, he, nothing could live in that mess that we read about in Genesis 1.2. But we do find the earth in a place of desolation and lying in waste. Uh, can you imagine how horrible that sounds? The, 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 the earth was without form and void and darkness. From it. And it was saying the earth was in utter chaos and, and, and disruption. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. I'm assuming that the face of the deep was referring to water. I assume. But here's my point. God didn't make it that way. But by the time the story of man becomes involved, it is in that condition. So that means something very simple. It means God changed it. Now, I've encountered people, and, and people of faith that believe in the Bible, Word of God, and they're, they're adamant about the fact that the earth is only 6,000 years old. And, and I've come to a conclusion as I've read about them, talked to them, and, and they're, they're adamant about, they, they get scared to death when they talk to somebody that says, well, I believe the earth is older than that, but I do believe humanity is what it says. I believe the story of humanity is that, but I don't believe it was all made at the same time. I think it was a story that, well, they're afraid of that what you're doing is you're, you're uh, engrafting the idea of evolution. I don't think the earth evolved into what it is. I think God made it what it is. So you don't have to connect creation and, and Adam together to necessarily... In, in other words, if you disconnect them, you, that is not embracing evolution. And I tried in vain to persuade others of that sometimes. <laughs> but the prehistoric age is talking about what happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And we don't know what happened. All we know, is, and we don't know how long it is, by the way. We, we don't know what happened, and, and the truth is it doesn't really matter. But we don't know. And this stuff is fuzzy to us because no one really knows... Uh, and, but something changed the earth's condition. Uh, and I personally believe that Genesis 1-1 is talking about the way, way, way back in the beginning. As a matter of fact, the word beginning literally translated into English from the Hebrew means in the first place. So it's literally saying way back in the first place, God. And that's all that God was going to share with us. Because he knew we're going to wonder where we came from. He said, I'm going to tell you about earth because you came from it. And the thing you need to know about earth is that I made it. And you don't need to know nothing else because it'll blow your little minds. <laughs> but way back. Now, one hypothesis that we've talked about before is that 
It, it, would, it could have been Satan's expulsion uh, with a third of the angels. That is a possibility uh, of what could have created the destruction of the earth. And, but we don't know. It's, it's a hypothesis. It's a, it's a guesstimate. Uh, the age of the earth is unknown. But we do know this. We do know just from studying uh, historical things in geology that, that global scale changes have occurred historically on this planet. We have evidence and proof of ice ages. We have evidence and proof of dinosaurs and, and, and all kinds of things. The flood of Noah was one of the major breaking up and, and, and reorganizing of creation. By the way, the Bible says there's one more coming. There's a renovation by fire that's coming again at the end of this thing. Where the, where the oceans are going to be done away with and no more sea, and God's going to reorganize the whole thing. My personal belief is he's getting it organized for a brand new production that he's going to do because he's eternal. And so the, what I'm wanting you to see is this. We also know that man did not originate those changes. Unless you want to blame it on sin. Now, in, in, in that light, man did originate the flood of Noah because God responded to man's sin. But what, I'm, what I mean by originated, I mean, I mean make it happen. Uh, man became so helplessly sinful, according to the Word of God, that God decided to start all over and, and break up and change the pattern and geology of the whole earth to do it. We've, we talked about all that last year, in the, or maybe it's longer than that now, when we talked about all the uh, creational stuff. Here's my point. The earth, or sometimes what we refer to as nature, is too powerful for man to originate those huge changes of it. Think about anything that man has done. We've had huge oil spills. We've, we've had, uh, you know, Chernobyl. You know, we, we've, had, we've had all kinds of issues that, that man has made a mess in this earth. And yet the earth is like Timex. It just keeps on, takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And it's amazing how the ecologies will reset themselves even after, after sometimes it takes a long time. But my point is this. This is why I say to the church, I don't buy into this hair on fire climate change stuff that, that is going on in our uh, world because there's an agenda attached to it. The earth is always moving and adjusting and and. and uh, and, and yes, temperatures change and evolve. I do think there is measurable change in the temperature of the climate. I just don't think it was because of us. And here's the interesting point. We have had 12 years to turn this thing around since the 1970s. The reason why this stuff that people are spewing nowadays to the younger generation rings a bell with them is because they're not old enough to understand they've been saying this for 50 years. And when you look back over the history of the thing uh, and, and the actual tempers, by the way, we've only been taking temperatures on all of this in the last 150 years or so. Our, our measurements are, are so... So we're making all these colossal decisions... Over a hundred year, hundred years worth of data, you know, and and acting like that 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 accounts for the for the however many thousands of years the Earth has been here. Don't let this world crank you up like that. Let me tell you, this is where a biblical worldview helps stabilize mental health. It'll help you sleep better at night, and help you know what voices to turn off, because. A real, a real biblical worldview gives us an access to understand seed time and harvest will continue until the Lord decides to change it. That's what he said. There was a look at verse five, uh, Philippians four and five. 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful. Everybody say careful. That means anxious about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord did not design our minds to be able to walk around with the anxiety that the world is going to end in 10 years. You'll end up on Prozac. You'll end up on all kinds of, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol and all kinds of other crazy stuff. And, and, and you'll buy into hair on fire stuff and all that. You know what? It's time to let the peace of the Holy Ghost just come on to the people of God uh, and go back to the Word to find out truth. It, let me tell you something. The biblical record of all this makes a whole lot more sense than the stuff we're hearing out of quote-unquote science nowadays. Because it is not just pure science. It's agenda-driven, spirit-driven stuff. And so we're trying, and, and this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to change the planet instead of trying to change ourselves. You know, the Bible says the whole earth groans. For what? The coming of the Lord. Earthquakes, he said, would be in divers places. He said there would be a lot of geological signs that would be leading up to the coming of because the whole earth, creation is calling out to the master. <laughs> creation is sensing the master. Is it possible that I could be living in the middle of a crazy weather pattern that's created by the creation groaning for the coming of the Lord and I am the one that's going to be raptured and I'm sitting here oblivious to it? <laughs> How is it the sea oceans can know more about the coming of the Lord than me? <laughs> Revelation 4 indicated that a third of the angels were banished to the earth. Did that cause the chaos? We don't know, but it, it's an interesting theory. The Bible indicates this. Satan is headstrong about the idea of totally capturing the earth under his dominion. The good news is Jesus is also headstrong about it. <laughs> And he's more hard-headed than the devil is. So when those heads clash, God's going to come out the winner on that. Bring up 2 Peter 3 on screen. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Watch this carefully. The Apostle Peter is writing about historically. He said that the, by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, that then was being overflowed with water, perished. He's talking about the Noahic flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. P Peter was again referring to what the book of Revelation uh, refers to, that the earth is going to be renovated by fire at the end of the age. But it is not something I'm worried about tomorrow. What I'm looking for is not the destruction of the earth. I'm not looking for, the, for everything to fall. I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. I need to get my eye and my ears tuned out. I want to hear his coming. I want to see him coming through the clouds. Praise God. So all of creation is groaning and experiencing calamity. Because the end is coming soon, and God's going to set it all in order. That's why you hear me say from time to time, I'm not all cranked up about this climate change stuff, and I get irritated with people that are trying to slap all kinds of archaic, nutsy policy upon me because of the, of the, of the climate change. It, it, the, it's, the data is just not there. But the bigger point is, is that the reason there's no fear and anxiety that is because it's the peace of the Holy Ghost that comes from a biblical worldview. Now, is the earth going to fall apart and be destroyed? Some, yeah, at some point, but, but I ain't going to cause it. <laughs> Driving my, my SUV is not going to cause the earth to end. 
And we, we need to shake ourselves of some of that stuff and, and stop worrying about crazy stuff. Now, should we care about conservative? Of course, we want clean air and all that looks like. But, but it doesn't mean that, that, that this hair on fire stuff has got to stop. The people of God need to grow and mature and learn to look through the lens of Scripture and let it and graft it. Let it literally take control of your thoughts and your thinking. Can you say amen? amen. So we're talking about ages and stages and dispensations. We're talking about cutting the word into manageable, better to be understood things. So the Bible is a very complex book. It's written by over 40 writers, over 1,500 years, but only one author. And that's why it all pulls together in such a majestic way. Studying the Word of God requires an incredible amount of patience and time and prayer and meditation on the Word and, and patience in seeking God for understanding. And the sheer scope of the, of the content of the Bible is amazing. And it requires a formulation of a pattern of how to divide it in order to study it better. The Bible itself separates itself and compartmentalizes itself in certain natural ways without us even having to get into trying to think bigger about it. For example, the biggest uh, singular cut uh, is obvious. The Bible's cut in two between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then on top of that, the Bible automatically cuts itself into 66 different cuts with 66 different books of the Bible. And then it cuts it again by the fact that 39 of those books are in the Old Testament and 27 of those books are in the New Testament. And then it cuts it again when you look back into the books themselves uh, and the Old Testament Jewish books. Uh, when you study those, you notice that the first five books uh, are what we call the law or the Pentateuch because they have a, they have a, dis, a distinctive pattern to them. The next 12 books after that are considered uh, historical books because they basically have much to say about the history of Israel, the nation of Israel. Then the next five books after that are another cut uh, that we call the books of poetry. They're, they're more of a generalized book like Proverbs and so forth. Then the next 17 uh, books on top of that is known as the prophets and even the writings of the prophets are cut in half, their prophetic words cut in half, major prophets, minor prophets. Now they're major and minor by length, not, not by importance. <laughs> um, and then you come into the New Testament and the first four books of the Bible self-divide themselves by, we call them the Gospels, because they basically tell the life and times of Jesus Christ. And then the fifth cut is the book of Acts, and it's, it's, it stands on its own because it's the history of the New Testament church, the early church. And then right after the book of Acts, the next 21 books we call the epistles, or the, right, the epistle just means a letter uh, by uh, the apostles. Fourteen of them or it divides up were written by Paul. Seven of them were general epistles. Uh, and then, of course, the last book, is uh, the book of Revelation, is like the book of Acts. It stands all by itself as a book of prophecy. Okay. So you have the Gospels, then the history of the church, then the epistles. And it's interesting to me that the book of Acts tells us how to be saved. The epistles tell us how to stay saved. So if you think about this, God gave us one book to tell us how to be saved, 21 books to tell us how to stay saved. <laughs> Does that give you any idea about how, the, how much effort and, and thought we need to be putting into this? Now, all of those cuts and divides, again, we're rightly dividing the word. All of these things were done by the book itself. Now, and, and meaning we did not make those cuts, particularly the Holy Ghost did in how he had it designed and written by foot. Now, I believe the reason he had it written by different authors through the times is because the Holy Ghost was self-cutting the word in certain ways so that we could grasp it better. Uh, now, later, we as translators, mankind, I mean, added 
chapters and verses to it. When it was originally written, it wasn't verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. It was just written straight through. But we went in and divided it up with chapters and verses. And I'm going to tell you, I'm very thankful that we did. And I would imagine every Bible quizzer should be thankful that we did. <laughs> How would you even have Bible quizzing without chapters and verse? Can you imagine not being able to write down a, a verse and, and, and find the verse, you know, if without all that, we say, what's your favorite verse? Well, I don't know. It was somewhere back around the 60% uh, in somewhere. It'd take me a while to find it again. <laughs> but because of all these cuts and rightly dividing, it, it all just, you know, it, it's breaking down so that we can understand. Now, for a lack of better term, I think that we also have divisions of time, stages, we're talking about ages, stages, and then the Bible says dispensations. We didn't make that word up. It's a Bible word. It was, it was, you know, it was recorded in the Scripture itself. Paul called the dispensation of grace, for example, what he was in. The Greek word was the administration. So we have, we have a few uh, administrations or dispensations that we can, we can acknowledge just by looking at them. It's not that that we consider dispensations to be an, uh, an end-all. You know, so I said, when did it start? When did it begin? Well, you know, there can be some disagreement as to how they overlap and this and that. The point is that they're there not to be, you know, just uh, so harsh about. They're just there to help us understand. I personally have been able to gain a whole lot more understanding from the Scripture if I start to view it in administrative senses. Now, what we mean by dispensations is they're very large periods of time, and they, they, they evolve with each other, helping toward a general end, but it's just simply there to help us understand. Let me give you an example. Bring up Ephesians 1 and 9, because I'm running out of time. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in the earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, when you start to view the Word of God and the different ways that God seemed to interact with man throughout time, you can call it a dispensation. You can call it anything you want to call it, but it basically just boils down to a form to help us understand the Word as a, as a big picture. Eventually, uh, at some point down in history, uh, moving forward, the time period of mankind itself, when this is all said and done, I think could be looked back on and called a dispensation. It just means, and it would be taking up all the others. Now, now the, theor, the, the theological theory behind this is that there's, there's at least seven uh, basic dispensations. And each of them begins with hope and ends with failure of man. But they open the door to the next one that leads into the next step toward redemption. Now, again, there's room for discussion on this, but, but this is good basic listings. It's like a stairwell that just slowly takes a step further and further up to the redemption of mankind. Now, this is what I want you to see. A dispensational is simply this. It's a discernible pattern of how God interacts with mankind at a particular season that if we identify it, we can notice it has differences to it. But here's the interesting thing to know. These seven dispensations or time periods uh, means that God revealed himself to mankind in, in slightly different ways. But it's to help us study and to see the big picture about line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We eventually will end up with the total picture and all the pieces put together. So there's the dispensation of innocence. There's a dispensation of conscience, uh, human government, 
uh, the dispensation of promise, or some call it the patriarchs. Then there's the dispensation of the law. Uh, there's the dispensation of the church or grace that we're living in now. Then the millennial dispensation. Now, again, these are just basic ones. And if you've ever been through exploring God's Word, you'll know that, that that Bible course is taught off of that same concept. But here's the thing. These uh, dispensations represented notable shifts. Everybody say shifts. Shifting of how God dealt with and, and still deals with humanity. Now, here's what I want you to understand. There is only one gospel. There's ever only been one gospel. There ever only will be one gospel. However, there were throughout time there were different methods of how that gospel was applied by God to man. And the redemption of mankind is what this is all about. And the redemption story of mankind from Adam until the end of this shooting match. When everything's said and done, if you want to know what the predominant story of the gospel is, it's the, the Bible is the story about the, the, the sin and loss and failure of mankind, but the redemption that was provided by God. Is that a fair thing to say? Okay, now, but they, but, and it always had three elements. The gospel or the redemption of mankind always had three basic theological elements that remained the same throughout time. It remained the same throughout all the dispensations. It remained the same from Adam all the way up to the age that we're living in right now. However, the, the way those three elements were applied was differently. For example, these three consistent, unchanging elements of redemption is this. Number one, is the shedding of blood is required for sin. Okay? That's an element of, of man will not be redeemed without the shedding of blood. Okay? Number two element that is unchangeable is faith is always required. That will never change. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The third element of man's redemption that will always be required is obedience. So the gospel or the redemption story of mankind from Adam and Eve all the way to the end to the white throne judgment always has those three elements. The only way man can ever be redeemed is he's going to have to have the shedding of blood, he's going to have to exercise faith, and he's going to have to uh, exercise obedience by that faith. So regardless of what time period or what dispensation you want to study, those three elements were always required by God. Now let me show you something. Go bring up uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. So the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament is writing to the Hebrew church. They had an Old Testament mindset. Look at what he says to them. Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood... There is no remission. And it is therefore necessary. Everybody say necessary. Mm. That the patterns of things in the heaven should be purified with these, uh, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now he's literally teaching to the Hebrew mind. He said, look, we, God gave us some patterns that we could use, uh, that he allowed them to be acceptable. But the truth of the matter is the reason that those three things had to be is it was a pattern that, that has to be fulfilled in the heavens. If man's going to be redeemed, it's not going to happen on earth. If man is going to be, be redeemed by what happens in the heavens. And so the sin, when mankind sins, or in other words, breaks the law of God, it is so serious that it always requires blood. It requires something to give up its life in order to cover that sin. That's why in the garden, with the very first people, the very first two people, the three elements were still there. And in the, in the garden, the first thing 
that, that God did after they sinned was God confronted them about the sin, and the first thing he did with the very first sinners was he had to kill something. He had to take one of the animals, and the Bible says he gave them coats of skins. Now, they had covered themselves with fig leaves. God said, get it out of the way. (laughs) That ain't going to do it. Because Adam didn't understand redemption. He didn't even understand fully what had happened yet. But he said, if you're going to be redeemed, you're going to have to have shed blood, you're going to have to have faith, and you're going to have to have obedience. And in the garden it was applied because God created the coats of skin and the blood had to be shed in order to hold off the total judgment of God. It was not a a cure. It was a postponement of sin. And God allowed animal sacrifices throughout the whole Old Testament uh, to postpone it, but it could never, animal blood could never reach the high bar of the justice of God. That's why God came down in the form of Jesus Christ, uh, because animal blood could only postpone the inevitable. uh, But it could not, uh, it it could buy time, but it really could not buy redemption. And so God allowed animal blood to, to cover. That's where the shedding of blood came. But then people still had to exercise faith in the word and obedience to the word in order to be saved, no matter what dispensation they were in. Until God came in the form of Jesus Christ to become our sacrificial lamb. And six, uh, you know what, quarts of a, of, a, of a lamb's blood, human lamb blood, it took away the sin of the world. It was no longer postponing judgment, it took care of judgment. Jesus bought us by redemption. But from the birth of the church on, I still had to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the shedding of blood and faith and obedience are still part of the redemption story in 2021, just like it was in the days of Adam. But how Adam applied it and how we apply it is two different things, and that's why we call it dispensations. We just simply are pointing out that it's applied differently, but it is not a different gospel. It is only a different application of the gospel. Well, just when I was getting inspired, (laughs) ran out of time. That's one of the big things that I wanted to get to us tonight, is the elements of redemption never change. I've heard people say and argue, well, I don't believe in dispensation because, you know, there there was, no, 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 dispensations didn't change anything except application. If you and I are going to be born again of water and spirit, we're we're going to, number one, there has to be shedding of blood. Thankfully, Jesus did it so we didn't have to. And I still have to confess faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He said, if I'll confess my sin, he's faithful and just, but then we'll get into it next week. I'm also going to show you How faith by itself means nothing. It has to be attached with obedience. Because if not, it disconnects the three elements that are consistent and required in the redemption of man that goes all the way back to Adam. Works works its way all the way through the time of the patriarchs. Works its way all through the law and the tabernacle and the wilderness. Works it all the way through to the cross in Jerusalem 33 AD works it all throughout the church age shedding of blood faith and obedience now I don't know what it's going to be in the millennial time I don't know what it'll be down the road but I'll promise you this it'll have the same three elements to it if there is human, if there are human beings that need to be redeemed it can only happen that way Blood, faith, and obedience. 
Amen. Stand with me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I appreciate you being in Bible study. I enjoyed that tonight. I feel the presence of the Lord. Would you lift your voice and just, would just, just praise Him right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. And we thank you for your truth and your grace. Uh, and Lord, I sense your spirit in this house, even as we teach your word. I ask you to bless this word, and I loose this teaching tonight into the body of Christ. Let it strengthen the people of God and challenge us as we grow in you, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Clap your hands. Give the Lord a shout of praise in closing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for being here tonight. We'll see you Sunday morning. Have a great week. Uh, singles meeting Friday night, Bible quizzing Saturday. Church will gather 10 a.m. Sunday morning. God bless.